Chan-Ning Chow, Head of Knowledge Access from New York University Libraries. She'll speak on a holistic approach to the planning and implementation of metadata inclusiveness. Our second speaker, Enid Winnings, is Digital Initiatives Librarian, Metadata Librarian from the University of Miami Libraries. He is also the chair of the Metadata Working Group of the Sunshine State Digital Network, SSDN. And he will talk about how they created the SSDN inclusive metadata and the conscious editing resources list and what's in this list. Now I'm going to turn it over to Christine. Thank you, Sai. Um, the remaining speakers are Anna Marie Close, the Metadata Initiatives Librarian uh, from the Ohio State University Libraries, who will be speaking about forming a working group to address EDI issues in the library. Uh, she will be followed by Trish Shores, who will be, uh, who's the founder of the Open Bibliographic Exchange Project, uh, will be addressing the creation, enrichment, and exchange of public domain bibliographic records between public libraries. And finally, Linda Garrison, who's a doctoral candidate of text and technology at the University of Central Florida, will be discussing classification and cataloging of LGBTQA plus material in the elementary school library. Um, this, the following slide uh, shows you how you can join the interest group, and there's no need to write anything down since um, the pres all presentation slides and uh, this slide deck will also be sent to you, as well as the session recording uh, will be sent to you by ALA Core later on to all registrants. And uh, finally, um, here are this groups, this interest groups chairs and co-chairs. Um, we will, let's see, um, feel free to put your, um, your questions in the chat box, but we are going to ask all the presenters uh, to introduce themselves and present their sessions first. And then if we have time, uh, we will be uh, asking them questions at the end. Thank you. Charlene, would you like to start? Can everybody see it? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so, good afternoon. This is Xiaoling Chiao from NYU. As the head of Knowledge Access, I manage the cataloging and the metadata services. Uh, I would like to say this presentation is to summarize some of the it summarizes some example of our meta inclusive work at NYU in year 2020. 2020. And uh, so all of these are NY stories, they absolutely teamwork. So I'm simply a storyteller. And the first I just want to go through the agenda is I would like to make this presenta presentation is more like a story. It's like there's a lot of story to share with you. And uh, first I want to introduce a little bit background is um, for example, recently we just received an announcement from Library Senior Leadership Team. As one of the key strategic party is decided to change IDB into the IDBA. It means inclusion, diversity, belonging, equity, and accessibility steering committee in year 2021. Last year, IDBE in collection working group published their report in fall 2020. And uh, I also want to introduce you is we have a technical services portfolio. We have four departments and it's called Knowledge Access and Resource Management Service. So I want to introduce to you, we reconfigure a sort of working group in summer 2020. And we also have the events like change the subject. There's a lot of story to share with you and the ones will give you an update on our working group. So I want to use this slide somehow to show you, um, it's really like a snapshot. 
there's so many voices from different communities and how to take new service res respond to these demands. For example, you can see the right-hand side, as you know, change the subject film. And you know, subject ALA subject analysis uh, committee also have a working group on the LCSH illegal alien report. SUNY, State University of New York, also have a report on illegal alien. As you know, for indigenous community, we're talking about different kinds of vocabularies. And uh, NYU diversity department also try to recommend inclusive, inclusive terminology. And as you can see, gender identity is really important topic in different community. So at NYU, we do have the ITB in collection working group. We also want to organize the event for change the sub subject screening and the discussion. And from different kind of student group, and also from special collection, we have different kind of group working on these issues. So that's the reason why in summer 2020, we decided to reconfigure a sorting working group. The sorting working group reporting to the metadata policy and implementation committee was reconfigured to create and maintain holistic policy around authority control and identity management, ensuring that we center the value of including diversity, belonging, and equity in our work with metadata. And I wanna use this diagram to show you. As you can see, authority working group, the scope has been expanded. Originally only deal with ILS authority data, now including much more. As you can see, left-hand side is really the joint force between metadata department and archive department. So for example, change the subject events originally organized by the IDB in collection um, working group. And because of the authority working group was, was just you know, reconfigured. So we have the joint force and to work on this events together for example, um, in this event, the first meeting is we focus on screening view in the film and uh, with the Slack discussion and also I had a conversation with the filmmaker and filming team. And the second meeting is really a brainstorm session and we divide it into four breakout rooms. So able to really encourage more discussion. As you can see the left-hand side, just two screenshots is a kind of suggestion and great comments from the small group vendors and the small group members and from the NYU community. As you can see, we have ongoing very active discussion in the entire NYU library and university community, communities. And after this change the subject event and just we receive a message from a subject librarian and she posted this message, sent this message to the entire library community. And she's very happy to share with everyone a few most recent changes made to LC subject headings. As you can see, she has three examples. The first and third one, you can see the terminology being changed. One changing from massacre to genocide, another one changing from riot to massacre. The second one, in recognition of the transgender day, and the subject heading is added for that called minority transgender woman. So we were so delighted to see a response actually from the communic communications department officer. And she sent to the subject librarian and said, I'm curious about this subject headings and love the changes. Is there a place where I can find more information about how these changes happen and why? Is there a lib guide available? So this message being forward to the knowledge access, uh, again, to the, in, to the authority working group. So after this message, we were able to establish a very formal communication channel with the communication department. Over here, this is a great example. Um, it's an archival collection at the NYU Special Collection. And this great example was discussed at the authority working group. And I really want to share this article with you and it's called Writing Wrongs. 
imperative description for Japanese American wartime incarceration. It's written by a special collection curator and a sessioning archivist. And uh, I would love to read a few sentences because they are very powerful. Language evolves over time. Think about words or phrases that you once utilized that are no longer popular or have since been critiqued as being harmful and offensive. So our sessioning archivist, Rachel, noticed euphemistic terms like internment, relocation, were used in the collection finding aid to describe the experiences of Jap Japanese American during the World War II. This deliberate bureaucratic euphemism downplay the reality of the sanctioning violence that Japanese American face as a result of President Franklin Roosevelt Executive Order 1966. That's why my colleague Rachel, she wrote a document to record local descriptive decision on Japanese American incarceration. And I think this table really showed the contrast between, you know, euphemistic terms and accurate terms. For example, internment, for example, it was used as an evacuation, but actually should be forced removal. So that's why authority working group, we have a subgroup try to do collaborative work on new LC subject heading proposal. And we review the existing LC subject headings. So we're thinking about all the research done by Rachel, how can authority librarian work with her together? We're going to propose some revision on, on and new LC subject headings. This is another great example from research services, our librarian for gender and sexuality studying. And she just say interdisciplinary terminology has an implication for metadata production, evaluation, and management. For example, take a Boolean search strategy to find literature on transgender identity formation. Just look at this search strategy, it's so long. And just simply want to make the search result more, more um, comprehensive. As you know, um, gender and sexuality study where language is consistently evolving to reflect new understanding of social identity and experiences. So this new authority working group only five months old. So still work in progress. And we are trying to use hybrid approach have four subgroups, including LC subject heading, communication, community engagement, and, um, and the user stories. So we truly believe we can communicate and collaborate to fulfill the same goal as one community. Thank you for listening to NYU Stories. I really want to just, you know, share a special thanks to my, all my colleagues at NYU. Thanks. All right, I believe I am up next, so I'll go ahead and get started. Um, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming today. And thanks to Sai and Christine for inviting me to speak at the, this session today. I'm really excited. Um, my name is Elliot Williams, and I'm the Digital Initiatives Metadata Librarian at the University of Miami Libraries. And I'm talking with you today from my home in Austin, Texas, which is on the traditional lands of the Tonkawa, Kapachi, and Lipan Apache peoples. And I want to respectfully acknowledge those tribes and all of the indigenous people who've lived on and stewarded this land. Um, I'm here today to share a little bit about the creation of the SSDN Inclusive Metadata and Conscious Editing Resources List. Um, the resources list was created by the SSDN Metadata Working Group, which I chair, and was released last fall to help support metadata practitioners learn more about how to create inclusive and anti-oppressive descriptions. Um, I also want to frame my presentation today by saying that I'm a white cisgender gay man, and I bring those identities and experiences to my work with creating inclusive metadata. So to kind of start out, 
just an introduction to what um, SSDN is. The Sunshine State Digital Network is the DPLA hub for the state of Florida and helps cultural heritage organizations in Florida share their digital collections with the Digital Public Library of America. SSDN is also a network of institutions and cultural heritage workers who share resources and develop best practices for digitization, metadata, and digital projects. And the SSDN Metadata Working Group is part of that network. The Metadata Working Group is made up of people from throughout Florida who work as catalogers, metadata librarians, archivists, um, at a range of public, academic, and state institutions. A lot of the metadata working group's work focuses on creating resources to help people who manage digital collections describe their resources in ways that are useful, shareable, and user-friendly. And so as part of that work, last year we created the inclusive metadata and conscious editing resources list, which is what I'm talking about today. Uh, and before I go any further, I want to make sure and say that the resources list was created by the working group as a whole, um, who's, all of whose names you see here, several of whom I saw are in the participants list of this session today. Um, and I'm here today talking about it because I'm the chair of the group, um, but the creation of the list was really a joint effort by the entire group. So the Within the metadata working group at SSDN, we've sort of discussed issues relating to diversity and inclusion and anti-racist metadata um, on and off over the past few years that we've been in existence, but we hadn't really made a, con a concerted effort to think about or address those issues collectively. Um, and then of course, this past year after the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery and the reinvigorated Black, Black Lives Matter protests, SSDN and the Metadata Working Group decided that we needed to devote more time to how we could better integrate EDI concerns and anti-racism specifically into our work as people who work with and manage digital collections. And whenever we discussed issues related to EDI or, or similar topics in the group, lots of group members would share resources that they were familiar with, um, presentations they'd seen, articles they'd read, related websites, all sorts of things. Um, and similar resources were being shared during the community conversations that SSDN was convening at the same time. And so the resources list started initially as a place just for us to put those resources so we had them in one place, so they weren't just sort of scattered through the, min the minutes of our meetings. Um, and at the same time that the metadata working group was having these conversations and starting to gather these resources, um, SSDN as a whole, led by our network coordinator, Kayla Zayas Ruiz, began planning a webinar slash workshop series for the fall focused around inclusive metadata and conscious editing. And we realized that the resources that the metadata working group was compiling could be a really useful complement to the workshop series. So we decided to turn the resources list into a public document for sharing outside of uh, just our group. And so together the group continued gathering resources, came up with a way to organize the list and ultimately published it. Um, we published the list at the end of September, right before the SSDN conscious editing webinar series began. SSDN promoted the list through the webinar series and through its newsletter and social media accounts. Um, and we've really been gratified to see that people seem to find it useful. So the list itself includes 41 citations to a variety of resources, including books, journal articles, blog posts, websites, digital collections, um, and more. We tried to be really um, expansive with what types of resources we included. Uh, here's on the screen, you can see the text that we added as an introduction to the list. Um, and as you can see, the scope of the list is intentionally fairly broad. Although the list in initially grew out of conversations around racism and anti-racism in particular, um, we also included resources that deal with other issues of inclusion, um, including sexuality, gender identity, ability slash disability, and um, indigeneity. Because the working group includes people whose jobs involve bibliographic cataloging, archival processing, digital collections, metadata, kind of the whole range of descriptive practices. Um, all of those arenas are, are represented to some degree. And we chose to include all three because we feel like there's things that we can learn from each area, right? Um, even if I mostly do digital collections metadata, there's still a lot I can learn from the conversations that archivists are having or um, mark catalogers are having. As far as the resources and structure of the list, we wanted it to cover both kind of broad, high level theoretical issues around bias in libraries and archives, as well as really practical case studies and tools for doing metadata work in a more equitable and inclusive manner. And we also included examples of institutions and collections that really demonstrate um, some of the work that's being done around inclusive metadata. 
um, since a lot of us felt like that can be as helpful as reading a case study, it can be just as helpful to sort of see it in action. And we structured the list around the, those kind of types of resources, assuming that some people might be interested in, um, you know, a sort of theoretical framework, some people might be interested in looking at um, an example. We also tried to be really intentional about creating mechanisms for feedback and suggestions. We recognize that even though the list was never meant to be comprehensive, there there were likely resources that we weren't aware of that should have been included. Um, and we also recognized that people might disagree with some of the resource, resources we put in. Um, and we wanted a way for people to talk back to the list. So we provided methods for both direct and anonymous feedback. Uh, mine and Kayla's emails are provided and we also created a Google form for anonymous feedback. So as I said, the reading list has gotten a, a good amount of traffic and we've in general had a good response to it. But I'm also really conscious of the fact that a reading list is just that, and you know, it's not going to solve all of our problems. So I wanted to use this presentation as well to kind of think about what use a reading list like this really is. And so I'm sure all of you remember this past summer, there was a huge increase in the number of reading lists and similar documents about racism um, that were produced by libraries, as well as a whole range of other sources. And there was also some sort of pushback against those reading lists. And I think that's really important. Um, Nicole Cook has this really great piece from uh, last summer in Publishers Weekly about creating an anti-racism reading list. Um, and she says that just reading a reading list, just reading uh, books, just reading Ibram X. Kendi's How to Be Anti-Racist or Robin DiAngelo's White Fragility will not make you anti-racist. If it did, we all could have been anti-racist years ago. And I think similarly, as you know, librarians and archivists, just reading work by Dorothy Berry or Jessica Tai or the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia Cooperative isn't going to magically make us stop creating or maintaining racist or otherwise problematic metadata. And even less, we'll just putting those works on a reading list and not actively engaging with them, right? The work of becoming anti-racist and incorporating anti-oppressive practices into our professional work is much more than that. and takes a lot more effort and intention and action. Um, and frankly, we'll take a lot more work than just remediating our metadata, really. Um, and in this, in her Publishers Weekly post, Cook gives a really great model of what an anti-racist journey can look like. And I definitely recommend that if you're interested. Um, so this, I, you know, I, I've been thinking about this and I really took it to heart, but I also don't think that any of it means that the SSDN resources list is useless or that the process of creating it wasn't valuable. Um, and so I wanted to think a little bit more about that. So for those of us, I think, who are newer to the work of EDI in cataloging metadata, and especially those of us who come to the work from more privileged backgrounds and identities, learning from and engaging with the work that our colleagues and other institutions are doing um, is really important. It helps us understand what the issues are and helps us see what sort of possible solutions there might be. Creating the list together was also an opportunity for the working group to sort of shape our understanding of what we mean when we talk about inclusive metadata and conscious editing. Um, in the process of adding resources, deciding what to include and how to structure the list, we discussed what kinds of issues exist around diversity and bias and metadata and what tools and strategies there are for dealing with them. And we also learned together about what each other had experience with and thought was important in this area. The SSDN Metadata Working Group is fairly diverse, both in the identities of the members and the types of resources and collections we work with. And I think creating the list gave us a way to, to share and learn from each other. Um, creating the, the resources list was also a way for the working group to collectively establish that issues of diversity and inclusion are really important to us as a group. Uh, and promoting the list let SSDN do the same, right? It, the network has clearly signaled that we think these issues are important and require serious thought and attention. And while that obviously isn't enough to solve the issues, um, it's still a necessary first step for us as individual library workers and for our institutions. Uh, plenty of people have been working on these issues for have been talking about and working on them for much longer. Um, so I don't wanna give us too much credit for sort of joining the work now, but at the same time, the work needs to get done. And if creating this resources list provides another entry point for us and other people to get started, then I think that's worthwhile. The key point is that it needs to be seen as a starting point, not as an end goal in itself. So that's, that's my talk for today. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I look forward to hearing your questions and reactions. Feel free to reach out to me by email um, or on Twitter. And please do reach out if you have any um, feedback or suggestions about the resources list itself. Thanks so much.
Hi there, I'm Anna Marie Close, a Metadata Initiatives Librarian at The Ohio State University Libraries. Can everybody see my uh, slides properly? Uh, uh, yeah, we also see the panel. It's not, it's not. Okay. A, uh, Let's try that. Does that work that's now? Better. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, so I completely agree with Elliot that uh, simply reading is not enough. We have to put things into action. At the Ohio State University Libraries, though, we're still getting started. Um, we have an equity, diversity, inclusion kind of strategy in, in terms of the library. Um, but what a lot of us weren't seeing was having that applied to the metadata realm. And um, so a lot of other people have also talked about change the subject, and we saw that too. But we still have things like this in our catalog where it's illegal aliens all through it. And I kind of was pestering people in library wide meetings, hey, let's have a group about, you know, talking about these issues. And everyone was kind of like, uh huh, uh huh. And as soon as you, you kind of push the, the mark for something like this, you um, automatically get volunteered to run a group. So I started a informal EDI CV and description working group. And it consisted of 12 librarians and staff in several units. And we talked about this as kind of a reading group over a number of months. And we also viewed things. And the goal was to have a annotated bi bibliography as an output put so that we can share it with our colleagues elsewhere in the library to really consider these metadata issues seriously. And so the scope of this was about how controlled vocabularies and description affects libraries, archives, and museums. Um, potential themes were inherent knowledge structures, reparative, reparative metadata, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, religion, culture, disability, socioeconomics, and age. And while we preferred newer resources, we felt that older ones were correct too. And I would say that um, do not, if you're, if you're looking to dive in and you're trying to find where to start out with, um, it's not just formal journal articles that can be helpful. There are a lot of white papers out there. Elliot was talking about a paper that they're working on. Great webinar recordings, websites, blog posts, contemporary news articles that can all help you become more aware of the issues. Um, I try to avoid a focus on classification because that can really eat up time all in and of itself. Um, one of the big things we learned is, you know, libraries, we like to say that we're neutral, but we're not. We, we other people and groups. So um, if you look at a lot of these resources, they talk about, you know, Mark Twain isn't described as a male, white, Christian, you know, ableist, cisgender, Anglo-Saxon author or heterosexual. A lot of, you know, a lot of the other labels come when we other people. And so the center of what we consider normal in traditional knowledge management tends favors a very small portion of the population. And that's a huge problem because when we say we're neutral, we're really not. And we have to think, rethink how we address this as a whole. Um, if you don't like history, well, you really need to go into a history lesson and look at some of your resources about the foundations of classification in subject analysis, because unfortunately, it a lot of it goes back to Library of Congress and of course Dewey and how everything that's outside that main realm gets othered. Um, LC is not a national library. So we've seen that for instance, with illegal aliens, it becomes a political issue. And also there's a whole history of subject terms that have really taken a long time to change. Even something as simple as a light bulb, which is not an EDI issue, having it updated has taken an enormous amount of effort. And unfortunately we have other systems like OCLC, we've got Wikidata and they all tend to kind of mirror the imbalances we have in our traditional knowledge management systems with Library of Congress and Dewey. And so I'm gonna be sharing my slides and actually adding a few more things, but here were some, some resources we looked at to, to get started. And um, I wanna point out that Julie Hardesty's webinar, if you just have one hour and you want to get the basics, that's a great way to start. Adler 
has a lot of amazing things that she's written on various topics related to this. Um, something, some takeaways are you really need to humanize individuals, both, both, both past and present. Um, there was an interesting article about 19th century depictions of disabilities and modern metadata. And it was about freak shows and P.T. Barnum and the circuses and how do we address disabilities? Do we treat them with a medical approach or is that othering somebody? And so I think there's things to really consider about that. And um, as Elliot brought up and others, the Archives for Black Lives in Philadelphia has a lot of amazing resources to look at. We really have to change the rhetoric about how we address things. And I think Charlene did that also where you're avoiding passive language and you're avoiding describing things in a way that is very slanted that we think is neutral, but really isn't neutral. Um, there is problems. I know that a lot of times we just wanna find something quick to fix the problem. And this work isn't quick. Um, there is no one term we can apply to everybody. And um, terminology changes over time and we have to consider that. And I think another thing to consider is identifying people without context. And I don't know, am I running out of time? I can't see chat. The right to be forgotten. Technology adds more problems. If you try to break up with the term illegal aliens, your ILS may give you problems. And we need to consult with communities. So we have a list of recommendations from this working group, some limitations, and a list of the working group members. So I'm sorry to go through that really quickly because I can't see the chat right now. Uh, yes, the PowerPoints are going to be shared. Sorry, I went really quickly because we have uh, more presentations to go. So I'm, I'm sorry I ran out of time, everyone. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Sai and Christine, for the invitation to present. On Monday at the Cataloging Norms session, I introduced a cataloging platform that simplifies and accelerates cataloging through the use of predictive algorithms and crowdsourced metadata. It aligns with the 2021 Cataloging Code of Ethics by lowering intellectual and financial barriers to cataloging. Today, I'll discuss the interlibrary exchange of public domain bibliographic records and inclusive subject headings. To keep everyone awake, here are extracts from the ALA's 1985 task force report on online bibliographic databases. Some of you may have read the 2020 library systems report by Marshall Breeding, which documents the churn of mergers, acquisitions and divestments by big library technology companies. In the grand scheme of things, innovating front-end cataloging software is probably not the lowest hanging fruit for a return on investment, which might explain by bi why big vendors have not effectively harnessed metadata to augment their cataloging products. As an independent developer, I can focus on problems that interest me without outside agendas. However, the challenge I faced with predictive bib was how to obtain large amounts of high quality metadata without licensing restrictions. As it turns out, catalogers solved that problem for me just by cataloging using the app. Predictive bib and open metadata fit well together and operate on a different set of tracks to restricted access networks and databases. I expect that open cataloging will eventually become a popular model because it can operate on pennies per record, stimulate innovation, is equitable through equal access and distributed responsibility, and will eventually 
and fills a global need. Just look at the community-driven cross-platform web technologies such as Node.js that have exploded in the last decade, forcing established companies like Microsoft to develop competing cross-platform software for Windows, Linux, and Mac, and bend over backwards to stay relevant to the software community. Switching gears, Predictive Bib just added a new feature, which was inspired by Emery Laprade's presentation on accurately representing diverse human experiences in a rapidly changing vernacular. The new feature allows catalogers to add unofficial subject headings and also auto suggest them back to catalogers. Since the software tracks subject heading usage, popular unofficial subject headings can be presented to the Library of Congress together with usage stats to bolster the case for adoption. Let's see how this works. I'll search for the book, Beyond the Gender Binary, in which the author explores inclusivity, tolerance, and self-determination. On the LTSH page, we see three subject headings. Emery kindly volunteered some unofficial subject headings, and I'll add one. Heading over to the finish page, I'll update the record. Let's open the binary mark file in ModMark to see the new subject heading. We can also open the RDF XML file generated by the Library of Congress mark to bib frame conversion utility. Heading back to the LCSH page, that unofficial subject heading is now auto-suggested. Filtering by tags LGBT and gender promotes it. It's the purple item. And finally, I wish to correct a misconception. Predictive Bib can be downloaded, installed, and ready for cataloging in less than five minutes because the cloud infrastructure is already in place and I manage it for libraries. So if a public library asks me to set up beta testing, I'll provide a download link to the desktop app and log on credentials and cataloging can begin almost immediately. Beta testing is of course free of charge and can extend as long as the library needs it to. Thank you all for attending. Okay, our last speaker, uh, wouldn't be able to join us. And uh, Linda has a class to teach at this time. So I'm going to uh, share, sorry, I'm going to share her slides now. I am Linda Garrison. I want to say thank you for allowing me to present remotely today, and I am sorry that I cannot be at the conference in person. I am sure that I am missing some excellent presentations. I will be skipping discussions about some slides, but I am leaving them in in case someone wants to view them later. My research interest is LGBTQAI plus classification and cataloging in the elementary school library. What piqued my interest in this research were the daily reports in the news about the extreme amount of discrimination in the statistics on this slide are heartbreaking, and this was before the Stoneman Douglas school shooting. That less than half of students could find LGBT information in the library is a clarion call to librarians. Statistics are even worse for transgender students. And as an ally, it was natural for me to ask what is going on in our society and our libraries and how can we help? Libraries are mandated to provide supportive environments and to provide diverse, inclusive collections. Research has shown that exposure to images of transgender persons decreases transphobia. School libraries are well positioned to provide those images and stories, but are we? Research suggests why are subject headings so important? 
to young students. Yes, literature must be discoverable, but it goes deeper than that. And we have to ask, what exactly does classification do? It helps us to understand, to co-locate, to organize. It's how we learn about ourselves and each other. It's how we learn normal and abnormal. Classifications help us structure reality, but it is an almost invisible political and ethical power. Classification. still fall under the same Library of Congress subclass. But we've come a long way. I love this image. It articulates the differences in gender expression and identity, sex and sexuality. The red arrow points to the disconnect between the LGBT community and the cataloging community because all of a lot of good work has happened in the last 60 years still happening today. Gender theory and cultural studies helps us do this work. Most of our work is copy cataloging. And let me say here, we could not do our work without the incredible dedication and effort of the professional cataloger. We know that you have worked tirelessly to improve our tools and models. The good thing about being a school librarian is that we can make local changes and we can teach critical cataloging. But can we afford the new tools? For example, global updating. My LMS offers it, but I can't afford it. And it is difficult to find time to learn about the new tools, such as linked data and LRM. I do have inclusive material in my library, but I am also a part of the problem because I placed I Am Jazz in the professional collection show up in my OPAC as LG material. Another paradox, we are still practicing self-censorship, often because of fear of challenges, but also budget. It's difficult to justify purchasing for three to 10% of red is a story that addresses the complexities of being transgender, but when I enter the term transgender, it does not show up. I need to add that term as a subject heading. This is a quote from Bishop's seminal essay and I'll just let you read it for yourselves. I'm going to add to Bishop's statement and say that where a book is placed on the shelf also teaches children where they belong in a system. Unless you believe in Bishop's windows as well as her mirrors in which she states that children from dominant social groups must see others' lives where they think their lifestyle is the only one that matters and my expectations of research. The school library is a place where students should find a rich, diverse, inclusive collection of books which reflect their lived lives, including those who are or who have friends and family members who are members of the LGBT community. By making previously black boxed classification and cataloging tools and practices transparent, my research will hopefully help librarians make and justify subject headings and classifications that elementary school patrons and affirming. Thank you very much. If you have questions, comments, or would like a copy of this, please email me. All right. I think now it's our, our Q&A session. Uh, so, Christine, do you want to... Uh, Read questions from the chat. Sure, I don't see any here right now. Um, I do see some questions before. Yeah. But, uh, this is this one is from Patricia. I'm torn between not wanting to other people, but how do we serve researchers who are looking for materials on Black African American female pilots? How to look for uh, materials on Black Amer African American female pilots? Do any of you, <laughs> does anybody know? Uh, okay, our next question is I frequently see it mentioned in this kind of workshops that LC is not a national library, and I always wonder is there any way we could make it so? Library Congress is not a national library. What does that mean? 
And yeah. someone, someone else says LC doesn't want to be the National Library of the United States. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. I do see that. I can speak a little bit and anyone else, please feel free to jump in. But just to the question of um, sort of the tension between othering people and identifying people. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a really, it's a really good point. And I think it's a really tough um, line to walk sometimes. Um, and I, I know a lot of folks are sort of moving in the other direction of, of explicitly identifying um, everyone's identities, um, including white men, right? Which is, I think, the issue is is that some identities are marked and some are are taken as the norm. And so I think that's, to me, that's sort of how you find that middle ground is thinking about what identities are being described, um, because there are sort of valid information needs, as you're saying, that that sometimes you are interested in um in particular um groups or individuals so that's my rambling way of saying i don't know that there's an easy answer to that but i think it's a really good question okay i, I see a comment from uh rachel um and uh she's commenting on the on the link uh violet shirt the link is on uh, changing the subject documentary uh, she said many uh, many high school students have viewed this film for discussions, and uh, it has uh, ongoing impact in our communities. So thank you. And so going back, going back to the uh, to LC, uh, someone says hi. I'm a library student, so I'm still learning about the information profession. If LC isn't the national library, why is it used so often? and held in so high esteem? Because it's all we have. Okay. It's the closest we have to a national library, unfortunately, but it is still the library of Congress. Mm -hmm. So that's why the, the backlash from illegal aliens really came from members of Congress who did not approve with changing um, that subject term. Oh, okay. That makes sense. And I guess an uh, 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 institute like uh, uh, OCLC also plays some kind of role because, I mean, uh, from library school, we've been using OCLC WordCat to, uh, for collaborative cataloging. <laughs> so, and it's, it has the uh, mark tag for LLC subject heading and classification from, from the beginning, I guess. So, Yeah, and someone noted in chat that alien is still a legal term. Okay, I saw a question for Therese. Uh, the question is, do you know what kind of institutions have implemented this software so far? Any <laughs> academic institutions? Well, thank you. Um, I just launched the software and um, it's been evolving rather rapidly. Um, it hasn't been adopted as yet, but it is available for beta testing. And I welcome anyone who's interested to contact me. Um, it has been geared specifically for public libraries because it has been trained on public library materials, which have been accessible to me during uh, lockdown. Um, but the algorithms, like the predictive algorithms, they are independent of, for example, the subject matter, the um, bibliographic record format, the material types, even the subject heading types that are used. Um, so it could conceivably be used for law libraries, medical libraries, um, you know, different types of academic institutions. Um, the learning process will uh, take a little bit of time um, when starting in a new subject area, but it will get there and it would be very interesting to work with academic institutions. So I definitely welcome um, hearing from you if you are interested in beta testing. Um, you can reach me by email. 
Okay, so uh, Ross Spetzer says, I'm interested in how presenters have dealt with their own blind spots. Uh, they're the sole professional librarian focused on cataloging at their institution and a white man, and he's not sure how much it will be, how much it will advance EDI if uh, he's the only one making all the decisions, even if he has the best of intentions. Would anyone like to answer that? Um, one thing that we did that was interesting in some of our ED work at um, Ohio State University Libraries, we had um, a bias testing we had to do. And that was a really interesting thing to identify what are your biases. That would be helpful. I can also say, I mean, I think, I think being aware of your blind spots is a really good first step. Um, because then you can sort of look for resources um, and guidance from other folks who, who might not have those blind spots. Um, and I would also say, you know, I think a lot of EDI work is, it's not, if you get trapped in thinking like, I'm, what if I don't make the, the only right decision or what if I don't make the best decision? that can be sort of, that can kind of freeze you in a place of inaction. And so, you know, even if you know that you, you might still mess up, you can still, you can still make an effort, you can still try things, you can still make whatever changes you can, um, even being aware of your own, whatever areas you might not have knowledge in. Um, so, so not to get too worried about you know, I might not have all the answers. Well, you might have some of the answers and you can start with that, um, that it's it's about, you know, small steps are, are important as well. If I may just speak to that, uh, I'm from uh, UMass, University of Massachusetts, uh, the Gatlogger and Metadata Library in there. And uh, yes, we all have our blind spots and it's so important to recognize them, though it's not easy to do so because we have so many millions of collections and if not millions, at least in the thousands. And sometimes it becomes difficult to identify, but one heading that comes to my mind and which was brought up today in the presentation was the alien heading for immigrants. And that does stand out. So I know of a librarian um, in our uh, Boston Library Consortium who actually wrote a normalization rule and it can be done and it can be done uh, in our library also if we decide to, and then change that heading into uh, a local heading. So the Library of Congress heading to be changed to a local subject heading because the Library of, it's, it will no longer be a Library of Congress heading. And this can be used, this can be done as a normalization rule and it can be done as a bad job to all the records that have this heading. So this was this is one small step, one small way of doing it. And also speaking to the earlier question that came up about, I know it's a little late in the day to talk about it, but I work for the Library of Congress. So I'd just like to say that it's the de facto national library, holds the, one of the oldest federal institutions, if not one, of, it's, it may be the oldest perhaps, I'm not sure, more than 38 million books. And when I visited it, it was like, the books that I had cataloged for it, I had actually cataloged in India for the Library of Congress. So when I actually visited in Washington, I saw the books that I had cataloged in tunnels, you know, which stretched for miles and miles below the library. So that was pretty impressive. So they have a great, great collection. And I think it is the biggest collection in the world. So, you know, by, by hook or crook, it's like the National Library, I guess though it doesn't call itself the National Library, but it is a de facto library. Uh, I think it began with Jefferson's books, right? Uh, Jefferson had donated his books to the library and that's yes. how they developed that collection. So uh, it is actually the largest library in the world. So maybe that's why we recognize it as, and moreover Mark and, uh, the Library of Congress subject heading and the Library of Congress classification is used all over the world. So 
I think that's how it is got that we get the feeling that it's it's the national library, even though it is actually not. It's it's more of a library for the Congress. And I think that that heading alien alien for immigrants also is something that needs to be changed by the Congress and somehow Congress did not agree to it, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and that is why it was not changed. But I am waiting for the day when it happens. But in the meantime, we can, we can actually resolve this issue locally by, uh, by actually doing a bad job on, on all the headings that we have, all the, all the material that we have related to this heading. So maybe that could be one of the ways that can be done at a local level. So that would be one of my blind spots, I guess. Okay, uh, we're almost out of time. Would there be anything else before we say goodbye? Okay, thank you all for attending this session. Uh, we appreciate it. And um, as I mentioned before, we'll be, um, or ALA Core will be sending the presentation uh, recording uh, the session recordings and the presentation slides. Thanks for attending. Bye-bye.